Lauren. Um, I'm just going to start off. Um, yeah, like I said, Alex couldn't be here, so I'm going to talk about LEAP on her behalf. Um, so I'm not probably going to give you quite as much as she would have been able to, but this is a really fascinating site in Hampshire that we've been working on um, with various organisations, uh, the New Forest National Park Authority mainly. Um, and it um, is a World War II site, essentially. So it was built in 1943 to construct the Phoenix caissons for the floating Mulberry Harbours. Um, and there's over 500 metres of the site that remains in various um, states of condition. Um, all sorts of things like construction platforms, um, launching slipways, winching gearboxes and so on. It's the largest collection of military remains built specifically for D-Day in the country, we think. Um, and it's all being impacted, it's right in the intertidal zone, so it's being really impacted by, um, by storm damage and just everyday um, tidal scouring and so on. Uh, these are some pictures, there's a historic photo here um, of the site when it was being used uh, during the D-Day preparations um, and how it is now. Um, it's a really lovely stretch of beach if you ever get to go down there. Um, and we've been going um, since the beginning of the Citizen project to record and monitor the site. Um, and we've got volunteers from a range of backgrounds who've been coming out with us. We've got the Hampshire Archaeological Dowsers. Uh, we've got the New Forest National Park Authority, uh, the Friends of Leap Beach, um, and just some members of the general public. And so we've been doing um, some recording and monitoring with those, um, with those groups of volunteers. Um, and something we were able to do as well was to um, get a drone survey of the site um, with our uh, drone pilot from MOLA, Pete. Um, and this is available online. You can zoom in and it's, the, the detail is amazing. So you can get an idea of the extent of the site. Um, and there's even more below um, that low water mark. So we need to sort of revisit it on a, on a really low spring tide. Um, but you can see how exposed it is and how it's being damaged. But it's quite a big stretch of coastline. I think there's a, I know there's not, there was a zoomed in picture of that just now. But this, um, this one is a 3D model. I think Alex has a video. Another 3D model today. Um. <laughs> Uh, that one of our volunteers made for us um, of uh, one of the slipways and he's annotated it for us as well which tells you a little bit about um, elements of it and a, a bit more about LEAP itself. So this was a really um, hush hush site at the time um, everybody had to sign the Official Secrets Act even the, the milkman that came to the site all the troops were hidden in the woodland behind the site and they were preparing for for D-Day, so it would have been a, a massive hub of activity. And now it's um, a nature reserve and a very, very quiet place to go to. Um, they've got a few um, interpretation boards up if you go down there. We're hoping to work with the, with the um, rangers at Leap Beach and with the National Park Authority to try and get some more um, information as well as a heritage trail so that people can walk around from the cafe. We, we like a site with a good cafe slash pub. Um, and this is one of them. We do a good sausage sandwich. And, um, and you can walk around from the cafe to the remains. Um, and it's a nice stroll on a, on a sunny day. Um, so we're going to produce a heritage trail leaflet that people can take around and have a look at what's remaining there um, and some old uh, photos of what it used to look like. So I hope I did Alex justice there. That leaf is really her site and it's an amazing site. But if you have a look on our website, you'll be able to find out more about it. And that drone image is one that's really great. We can probably get it up on one of the laptops later so you can zoom in and have a look at the, the remains. And also how much, how high resolution that image is is quite fantastic really so that is leap um, I'm going to whiz on now to Dorset um, you'll all have some Dorset fudge on your chairs as well which if you like you can follow at Sam's fudge on Twitter it's also my business on the side <laughs> just to get that one in there uh, Sam's my husband he makes it so um, we um, have done a lot of work on Brownsea Island. I think you've heard a lot about Brownsea Island over the last couple of days because it's awesome. And it's here, it's in Poole Harbour. Poole Harbour is in Dorset. It's the second largest natural harbour in the world. And Brownsea Island is the largest <coughs> island in the middle of the harbour. Um, there's several sites that I'm going to look at um, over this talk which um, are being affected by um, 
storm damage and changing sediment levels and so on, and the tide. Um, so these just show where they are um, around the island. Um, most of the archaeological features that I'm going to talk about are from the post-medieval period, and they relate to um, industrial activity on the island. There's not much from before that period. So Pearl Harbor was really, really well known for um, Iron Age activity. So there was a, a port there in the Iron Age, and they were undertaking trade across the channel. Um, but there's no evidence of that on the island itself. Uh, that's all on Green Island or on the mainland. Um, the only thing we've really got is there was a log boat found just off the island as part of dredging, um, and a possible Roman site that was found off the island as well. So chances are that anything older has now been lost or is, uh, is under, the, under the sea. Um, so what we do see today archaeologically is a lot of this um, post-medieval industrial uh, activity. And a lot of this is actually from a chap called Colonel War. He's really, really interesting. The island has got quite a colourful history. Lots of different people owned it over... Um, over the sort of last few hundred years. Um, Colonel War was actually only there for five years and he set up um, this huge pottery industry. Um, he was convinced that there was this really special sort of clay on the island. Um, got hundreds of thousand pounds from the, from the banks um, to fund this. He built um, a village for the workers, with a pub. He built, um, which is where we had our picnic with the wine, <laughs> the remains of the pub, it's very nice. Um, he built a, a tramway to go round the island from where the clay shafts were, which I'll show you in a minute, um, to, um, to the large pottery works. Um, so he built this huge infrastructure on the island, and then it turned out that the pottery, the clay he had, wasn't that good. And he went bust, <coughs> and him and his wife fled to Spain. Um, so <laughs> people tried to make it work after that, but unfortunately, I guess the cost of transporting all the material off the island and so on was just a bit much, and it, and it did eventually fail, but it's left us with some really beautiful um, archaeological sites. The one in the top right you've seen quite a lot is Barnes Brick Kiln, um, and then you've got uh, a couple of sites in section there as well. Um, these are some of the sites on the north coast. Uh, that one on the top left is one of the clay shafts, so they dug sort of 50 to 60 feet down to try and find this magical clay. Um, and they then went out underneath the harbour as well, so it's quite dangerous and um, quite an undertaking, really, to try and find this clay. The top right one is the remains of um, a cottage, which was the pottery manager's uh, cottage, and he would look out at his workers. It's a really beautiful one, which is, is crumbling, and that's actually the toilet, the round building there. It's the, it's the remains of the toilet. Um, bottom left is a, a pier that's actually built out of the old, some of the big old domestic clay pipes that they made there. And bottom right is the remains of Maryland Village, the, the village that he built for his workers um, and the pub. Um, so what we've been doing there is working with volunteers. The island is owned by the National Trust, um, but it also has a Dorset Wildlife Trust nature reserve there. So we've been working with volunteers from both the National Trust and the Wildlife Trust to record these sites and to monitor them. Uh, we did some offset survey um, in 2016, I think, um, and we were able to get these uh, plans made of those two features that I showed you that are eroding in section on the, on the southern shore, um, which is great, and they're up on our um, database now. And we've also been using 3D models, which you've heard a lot about, and this was one of the first uh, 3D models that we created in 2015, so for this brick kiln, because as Gus said yesterday, there's a lot of bricks there, you don't really want to have to draw those all by hand. Um, and Gus, you actually got your slides the wrong way around yesterday, because that the one with a lot of bricks is the early one, the one with less bricks is 2016, so it's quite interesting what we've got here is I think some of the sediment in the sand is actually building up on the site, which is quite good. But at the same time, the biggest threat to this is the vegetation. So if you can see that archway in the middle in 2015, that's actually collapsed by 2016. And that's, I think, as a result of the vegetation and the roots and stuff, which is crumbling this. So this is being like beaten up f by all elements and from all angles at the moment. So it's um, very fragile. Um, I want to go back this year and get another model. Um, I was meant to go back the other week, but Storm Brian meant that I couldn't get over to the island, so I'm going to try and go back in the next couple of weeks. So we've got three consecutive models, and we can really understand whether or not this type of technology can help us to take quantitative information 
and see how much this brick kiln is eroding and how much of it is being lost. Um, so yeah, next steps, continue to create a model of the brick kiln each year um, and also get the volunteers to help us with that as well. I want to create a site plan of the northern shore uh, to plot in those clay shafts and the pits. I want to see if there's perhaps any remains of the tramway that's connected those um, clay shafts and pits round to where the uh, pottery works were and to continue to provide support and training to the volunteers. The volunteers, they're excellent. They're out on Brownsea Island in all weather conditions. Um, they want to know more because the visitors that come over to Brownsea Island are always asking them lots of questions. And it's also, unfortunately, the visitors that come over want to take some of those bricks home as souvenirs. So the more we can sort of raise awareness about, um, about the importance of these sites, hopefully we can help protect them um, and, and do preservation by record. So that's our next steps there. And I'm going to pass over to Therese now, who's going to talk about the really tough time we had <laughs> on the Isles of Scilly. Thank you. Flash my thing on this. Sorry. Is there a pointer? Is that Great. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Therese, and I kind of came to the Citizen Party a little late. I joined this June um, this year, but I was very fortunate in that I got to tag along to the Isles of Scilly. Um, and when we were there, we spent a week, we were joined by our colleagues from Citizen North and Citizen South East, and also from Thames Discovery Project, and of course some uh, wonderful volunteers. Uh, so. We concentrated our attention on the north of St. Mary's Island and we looked at three sites. So we had a, a training session covering three days and we visited one of these sites each day. Um, the first of these down further south is Tolls Port and it's really, really interesting, a whole mishmash of amazing archaeology. Apparently there's a supposed prehistoric village there. Uh, I am a bit dubious about that. But there is certainly a um, Romano-British Kist Cemetery and there is also um, a civil war battery. Uh, we then moved slightly further north up along the coast to Halangi Port where our colleague Oliver did a very fantastic 3D model and what you have there is a, a definite prehistoric settlement thought to be late Bronze Age to maybe Iron Age and it's literally just eroding out of the cliff. It's uh, quite impressive uh, in, in its erosion and in, in terms of its structure. But the site that I'm going to talk a little bit about today is Penrathen, right up at the north there. and. It may be a kind of a funny choice, given all of the beautiful prehistoric material that we have, but I think it's a really interesting feature. And what you have, um, it's recorded in the uh, uh, Cornwall and Scilly historic environment record as a slipway, which lies at the high tide mark, um, thought to be post-medieval date, and composed of cobbles and slabs. And I think you can see um, it's a really beautiful looking thing. Um, and really no work has ever been done on it, apart from the fact that some photographs were taken by Cornwall Archaeology Unit back in 1990. And one of the interesting things that our volunteers brought was, of course, local knowledge. And they were able to tell us that it's actually disappearing from the landward side rather than the seaside, which is quite interesting. So for that reason, we thought it really important to record it. So here you can see our beautiful uh, view with our amazing volunteers. Uh, very sunny. It was sunny all week, so we were very lucky. And there we conducted a um, offset plan of it, which you can see there on the right. Unfortunately, due to time restrictions, we weren't able to totally complete the detail of the cobbles inside. But what we are in the middle or process of doing is making a 3D model of it. So what we hope to do is to be able to overlap that to pick up that detail and also maybe to explore whether or not we really need to continue doing drawings that are, can be quite complicated and time consuming. So that will be interesting. Uh, as with many of these things, we came away really with more questions than we have answers. So I'm hoping that somebody will be able to uh, maybe input and uh, help us out here. But one of the things that we're looking at, obviously, is the date. So I mentioned that it's um, in the HER as post-medieval in date, but that's extremely broad from um, mid-1500s right up to 1900. So we'd really like to be able to pinpoint a more precise date. Uh, what we do know is that the current key, which is here, was built in 1759, and we know that from the amazing writings of a chap called uh, John Troutbeck, who visited the site in, or he wrote up his, his findings in 1794, and he reported the building of the quay, etc. So that's a nice firm date to have. Our slipway, which is just 
200 meters up along the coast here is a very, very impressive cut through the cliff. So it's a very, very deliberate cut through the cliff. The cliff's about two meters high and the slipway just comes out there. So what we're wondering is if, would you invest the time and energy and expense of going to all of that trouble if there was a perfectly functioning key at the time? So we're, I think that the slipway is earlier um, and if it is earlier, then what was it and what was it used for? Because I think that the idea of a slipway, the traditional idea of a slipway is something where you launch your boat or you receive your boat. But this slipway just goes as far as the high water mark. It doesn't extend down. And when it does extend down, where you, when, you, when you walk off it, you're right onto a really, you can see in the far photo there, a really rocky foreshore that's quite difficult to navigate. So one of the things that we are considering is that it might have been somehow involved in the kelp industry, which was really important to the Isles of Scilly between, I think, 1683 to 1835, when the last kelp burning was recorded. And the thinking there is that kelp is harvested all around here. It was a well-known site for kelp harvesting. Um, and that maybe this structure here was somehow to ease access to the harvested kelp, where it was then transported up onto the higher ground and all along here are little examples of these kelp burning pits. Um, there's one definitely over here which we saw on our walk to the site, and I think that there probably were several more. Unfortunately, uh, you can see this World War II pillbox here. Um, that's just to illustrate the levels of erosion, because that was in memory of our volunteers. They were able to say that, oh, God, that was, that was still on high ground a certain amount of years ago. So the whole site is eroding heavily. So it's one of the ideas that we're playing with. So if anybody has, has seen anything similar in terms of the structure, it would be really good to hear and to kind of firm up what it's all about. One thing I think we, are, we were very lucky to that one, we saw it, and two, we were able to record it because it's, this photo probably doesn't do it justice, but it's a very beautiful thing and it's very distinctive and has a, a certain character to it. Um, but we wouldn't have been able to do any of that without our fabulous volunteers um, who were able to bring not only their hard work and dedication, but also an amazing uh, amount of local knowledge, which were, was really, really helpful throughout the week. We learned a huge amount about the, um, this particular part of St. Mary's. And that's it, thank you very much. Thank you.